The Julio de Burgos Cultural Center was originally constructed in 1879 as Public School 72, and it was the first school built in East Harlem. The building was designed by well-known school architect David I. Stagg, who also became the superintendent of public school buildings for the New York City Board of Education. In 1940, after declining neighborhood enrollment, it was officially closed in June of 1975. It was then revitalized in 1994-1995 under the ownership of the New York City Economic Development Corporation and was designated for community use. During this time, Thaya Boricua worked with Mayor Ed Koch and New York City Department of Cultural Affairs in founding the Julia de Burgos Latino Cultural Center. Since 1995, Thaya Boricua has been one of the main tenants of the Cultural Center. Organizations like Taller have been fulfilling the original vision of the Julia de Burgos Latino Cultural Center, which is to house and support Latino arts and cultural not-for-profits. Since then, the building has been home to several art exhibitions, workshops, and cultural events, all in which support and promote the Latino culture in East Harlem. Taller Burrico was pivotal in bringing the Julia de Burgos into existence. Through the organization's efforts, they are able to preserve and proactively promote Latino culture in East Harlem through arts and cultural programming, thus proving that local communities are able to reform and reuse space it has in existence. We started the Taller as an artist collective, a group of artists. Uh, it's an artist-run organization, uh, much different from other organizations that, that start with a, with a with a directorship and all that. We started out as a collective, everybody with the same uh, vote, voting power, you know? And we started in the late 60s, early 70s for the sole purpose of creating, supporting the artists involved with space, with materials, uh, with a support system for the artists, for one, for two, to create a, an organization that would create uh, awareness of the Puerto Rican heritage and Puerto Rican art here in East Harlem, and promote uh, art and education throughout the, the five boroughs. Um, my name is Christine Licata. I am the associate curator here at Taller Boricua. Uh, we do five shows a year. Uh, an exhibition year, and for each show, I curate, I co-curate with one of the directors, Fernando Salicru or Marco Stimas. The show that we're in now, Sorta Rican, was co-curated by Marco Stimas and myself. And as part of the show, Sorta Rican, which deals with the state of transculturation, the state of being between two places, the artists in this show are Puerto Rican, but also have grown up here and have American culture as well as Puerto Rican culture. So. It deals with the themes of how they deal with living between these two worlds, and which is a lot about our community as well. That is, it's a community of, of all Latinos, Puerto Ricans, Mexicans, Dominicans, and this, this state of living between two worlds, of coming from an immigrant culture, being able to hold on to your culture here, while also absorbing the cult American culture, is something that's very prevalent and, and relevant to our community. started by uh, 41 years ago today um, is twofold. On the one hand, we bring art and artists to the community. And on the other hand, we give artists a space to show their work, to actually then speak to the community. So it's a, it's a back and forth dialogue. Our curatorial goals when we put together shows are to do just that, to create shows that provoke dialogue, that look into the issues of, like I said earlier, social, political issues that confront our community. 
Uh, for example, you know, this show right here, Puerto Rican, speaks to Puerto Rican community, but we do many other shows as well that, whether it be gentrification or even just within aesthetics, within challenging the boundaries, we do shows. If we do a drawing show, it's something that challenges the boundaries of drawing, that brings our community into a dialogue where when they come, they're confronted by, well, what is drawing and how can we challenge these boundaries? And really speaking to them on a level where art becomes a conversation, where aesthetic theories become conversations. And that's really important to the directors as part of their vision, where art and life become one, where it's not something separate. The diet becomes part of, of your life, of your home. You come here, and it's where you can <coughs> hear music, hear poetry, see great art, have witness artist talks, be able to talk directly to the artist, like with, Ni with Nicolas Amor, being able to speak to an author. When we did our poetry series, being able to uh, speak to a, a poet directly and have dialogue with them. It's, it's a really wonderful system of integrating the arts in everyday life. Not only is Taller a center for community gatherings and discussion, but they are also known for offering scholarships and educational programs for our barrio youth. In the past, they have held a youth event focused on the issues of local gentrification called East Harlem for Sale. This is an example of a community organization working with and educating youth on important issues that affect and impact their neighborhood. They are actively involved in the community through every event and exhibition. They strive to promote the message of community support and cultural competency. Well, I think Tayer Buriqua defines what being Puerto Rican in East Harlem is. Um, it's your, you know, you're always learning about culture. Just this exhibit, like looking around, like we, this is, you know, Puerto Rican in New York City, Puerto Rican in El Barrio. Um, you go to Salsa Wednesdays, being Puerto Rican in El Barrio, I've never been to an event like that. It's such, it's so, to me, the first time I saw it, I, w I thought it was amazing. It's just like people in El Barrio, it doesn't matter if you, you really know how to dance or, you know, <laughs> it, you just come and you enjoy the music. It's Puerto Rican salsa. Mm -hmm. And people will not judge you if you're different, they'll just accept you because they're, they're just celebrating their heritage, their culture, mm -hmm. you know, and being happy that Puerto Rican food that's really great. Um, if you come to a poetry reading, it, you have, I don't know, Tato La Viera was here, you know, very recently, uh, La Gitana, you have all these great people that have, they grew up here, it's their home, and, um, and you, you know, discover their lives and their past, and you learn so much from them. The Tayel brings people together in the community, especially the elderly, that they have nowhere to go and enjoy their cultural music, mm -hmm. and it keeps them alive, you know, something to look forward to every week. Mm -hmm. People to see, people to see how to dance, it's a very spiritual thing to dance. And it keeps them coming, they come religiously here. I do, I know I do, I love it, I like the atmosphere, I love the people, there's no fights, there's no, you know, that stuff that goes on everywhere else, but, you know, here we all a family. In Arlene Davila's book, Barrio Dreams, she discusses how community is more than space and population. She argues that community must include organizations that associate culture. Quote, these associations of culture and place are central to understanding El Barrio's significance as a Puerto Rican and Latino space. Namely, for residents and for many Puerto Ricans in and beyond El Barrio, this identity is not solely based on the numerical dominance of Puerto Ricans and Latinos in the area, but rather on having historically worked, wage struggles, and imbued space with meaning and memories. Taya focuses on promoting and maintaining the community's appreciation and understanding for Latino art and culture, simulating and developing social and artistic conscience, as well as training and encouraging young artists, poets, and musicians to develop their artistic talents and to apply their talents to foster community pride and positive development. So mainly, you know, a taller, what El Taller has mainly done is like invite a every other organization to come and do programming with us because they don't have a place or maybe, they, you know, they don't have a place but they want to do the programming and we serve as that, as that conduit uh, to do it mm -hmm. uh, and that's how we have survived. But actually what's going to happen to this building because it's, it's prime real estate, 
is, is going to be a political issue. Mm -hmm. uh, because if it's, if it's taken away from the community, then you won't have a center, cultural center. Uh, EDC came in and informed us that they wanted to convert uh, the room, multicultural space that we uh, rent from EDC uh, together with the theater, which is upstairs, and combine them into one space and to have someone um, manage those two spaces. Uh, someone who would create income. Uh, they, their idea was that the city wasn't, wasn't uh, making enough money from this space. Thayer has begun a petition against the EDC and its threat. Community members can sign it online and at the center. With the petition, they hope to raise awareness of the struggle they are facing and to establish community support. The multicultural spaces was being questioned right now. And, and that space we have theater, we have uh, music, we have dance, we have poetry, uh, and also exhibitions. So it gets used for, and it gets used by the community also for community events, uh, parties, weddings, uh, uh, conferences, uh, political uh, um, health issues, whatever. Yeah. So, um, well, we run the space because we rent it, basically. You know, it's not because the Department of Culture Affairs is allowing us to use it. They're not, pay, they're not putting any money into it. We raise our own funds and we pay for the space, you know. EDC is economic development. Mm -hmm. It's not culture. So you can't, you know, um, how would I say this? You know, how come you have Bach and you have Mozart? They used to go play for the kings and queens and whatever. Mm -hmm. You know, other people, they're very advanced in their art but it doesn't, hit, it doesn't hit off with the time. And then later, after a few years, or, or God knows how many years, it always only pops up because it goes with the time. Mm -hmm. So you know, so you're, you're, you're really doing something really terrible politically with, uh, with this building, you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. And uh, it's really sad because uh, in any other country or all over the world, we tend in the United States, you know, conserve the Indians, uh, do this, do that. But what about uh, preservation of the neighborhood and the history of that neighborhood and whatever was happening do, during what period? We've been here 40 years. A lot of other organizations have go, gone under. Mm -hmm. Okay, so then you know how how do you how how do you work both? In, uh, in especially in Manhattan, when you talk about the arts, and that New York City is about the arts, you know what I mean? And how you know what about tourism? What about you know the neighborhood and stuff like that? If you take these, you know, like especially the seniors that come here uh, on Wednesday, you know, for Salsa Wednesday, they want Salsa Wednesday because they don't have anywhere else to go. Uh, anywhere else that you want to go, you're going to have to pay a, a lot of money to get in. Then you got to buy drinks, which are very expensive. Uh, and mainly they see this as a way of, you know, uh, that population, you know, uh, a way of they're getting out of their home, getting out of their depressions because they don't have any money. They don't have doing any exercise. Doing, doing exercise at the same it's time. Because they, you know, so it's a, it's a well-being well, well it's, it's a way for them to see with themselves with their people. You know. Authors Clara, Irazabal, and Ramsey Farhat discuss the fact that the way people think about space affects their understandings of the world and their politics. Historically, Latino communities have struggled for spatial identity and it has been proven to be an effective means for attaining cultural recognition, economic integration, and governance empowerment. Quote, spaces of alternative binding institutions, such as Tayer, provided the community with cohesion, identity, and a sense of place and belonging. Tayer sees the EDC's threat to their multicultural center as another brick in the path towards the complete gentrification of Spanish Harlem and a dismantling of the Latino community. 
Similar actions have been taken against Latino organizations in the area, such as La Marqueta, an open air market in East Harlem, Chica Luna, and the Association for Hispanic Arts. Taller considers these actions part of a concerted effort to erase the culture of El Barrio. The threat effectively takes away the self-determination and power of the community to find local solutions to their issues. Should the EDC be successful, it will potentially cripple all of Taller Boricua's community arts and cultural programming. You know, I do anything to help the Taller. So, me and my brother, my family, my friends come and help as well. Like when they need employees here, I had my friends come work for free just to help out. So. Anything. This Julia de Burgos Culture Center, for all that that it isn't or it is, it's well known. It's well known. People know to come from Puerto Rico or anywhere, and uh, it, it has a reputation as a cultural. It's a cultural entity in East Harlem. You know, first of all, you know how how it would, how it would work out whether where it be when it becomes well, you know. Things being what they did, it probably it probably resolve itself and it'll go under, you know, just like any other place. But at the same time, it's being the community is being undermined once once again. You know, we're being displaced once again. You know, it's the same old issue again. Mm -hmm. You know, revolving the revolving policy. You know, kick them over over there. You know, and that's it happens throughout New York City everywhere. You know, and the communities, they have to clunk it down the state. The people don't want to stay. I know, I know it is. The people, you know, the hard times and all that stuff. And they've, they've, we lost a lot of people here during the 70s and 80s, you know, because this, this East Harlem was a mess. You know, the drugs, the crime and all that stuff. Right? But, the housing stock was... Yeah, the housing stock was... In the South Bronx even worse because the South Bronx was burned down. Mm -hmm. And nobody talks about that. You know, New York City, the New York, the biggest uh, city in the world, you know. Mm -hmm. And to have that happen, what happened in the South Bronx, and then now it's like swept under the table and nobody talks about it. You know, it's a disgrace. It's a disgrace in this country, you know. So, so you know, so if the community doesn't, rile up and stand up, the same thing will happen again because, you know, the wave will just sweep the community clean and a new, a new, new wave will take over. As urban planners, you know, you have to take that into consideration because you're going to be going into uh, development, basically, you know. And what's happening in, in, in New York City, which has happened since the beginning, it's always t a turnaround culture. You know, one comes, one goes. One comes, one goes. It's like round and round, round and round, and round and round. You know, uh, things get moved. Uh, uh, communities get moved over here. This is built here. Robert Moses built the whole uh, west side with Lincoln Center and moved people. He, did the Cross Bronx Expressway, moved people out into, they created um, uh, Co-op City to house people, they created the projects to house all the people that were in tenements and all that, which, you know, so that, it changed like, like the culture of, of, of this city would change, you know, it, it's, it, it's, it's, um, it's art, you know, it's, uh, it's community.